The next speaker will be Jennifer Heldman, title of her talk, Geologic Exploration Enabled by Optimized Science Operations on the Lunar Surface. All right, well, thank you for coming. Um, I just wanted to take this time to talk about some of the geology that we hope to be able to enable on the moon. And we heard a lot this morning from Jack Schmidt about this, so um, hope to be able to build upon those experiences and lessons learned and do some additional field testing. I want to acknowledge um, co-authors here, Tony Colapreet, who's here. Um, he's the deputy PI of the Finesse Project. Um, also, Darlene Lim is the deputy PI, and Brent Gary is one of our science co-leads, and the entire Finesse and Basalt teams. Um, so what we're going to talk about in the next 10 minutes or so, um, conducting science and exploration um, for the moon and beyond there. And in this particular talk, we'll talk about analog missions um, for operational and engineering design to support science and exploration. So here I'm going to talk about two projects that um, these teams have been working on. One is Finesse. I'm the PI of that. That's a, a survey team. Um, so we do a lot of field work and work with a lot of folks in the community and across survey. And also the Basalt Project, um, which is led by Darlene Lim, who is here at Ames. She couldn't be at the meeting today. Um, and we've teamed up together so that the sum is more than the whole. No, oh, wait a minute, that's just not right. You know what I meant. So um, what we're doing is combining these field programs, um, leveraging uh, personnel, travel, postdocs, communications, software, instrumentation, et cetera, um, so we can maximize the field deployments and the knowledge learned um, from both of these um, field campaigns. So who's involved in this? So these are relatively uh, big productions. Um, there's a lot of people that are involved to have the high fidelity uh, mission simulations that we're looking to do. Of course, we have scientists, and I'll tell you, we're focused on um, volcanology and impact cratering as the two dominant geologic processes affecting the moon. Um, engineers, because we're doing uh, mission architecture studies and studies of CONOPS and whatnot. So we have communications, instrumentation, imagery, robotics, um, terrain modeling, AV, or uh, UAVs, uh, virtual reality, et cetera, et cetera. Um, postdocs, we have several postdocs that are here today. Um, students from high school through undergrads and graduates. Um, also education activities, I'll tell you about some of that because I think that the outreach component is really, really important and something we can capitalize on when doing these, um, these types of field deployments. Um, a number of institutions uh, across the board, NASA centers, multiple colleges and universities, research and private organizations. So you can see that there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of moving pieces that come together uh, to make this work happen. Oh, and of course, you got to have astronauts involved as well. So uh, there's a few. David St. Jacques, who's um, from the CSA, the Canadian Space Agency, has come um, up on our deployments to Canada. Jeff Hoffman, who's now at MIT, has come out in the field with us several times. We have several active astronauts who have been coming out into the field with us for several years. Um, and Steve Swanson, who's now in Idaho, has been uh, promoting this as well. So we're happy to have them come in the field, and it's great to have the astronaut office perspective, um, to have them involved to help guide um, what we're doing and the questions we're asking and get their feedback and also have that infused back into the human exploration process program. Um, so what we're talking about, what are we trying to address here? Um, for the moon, deep space, and Mars, new operational paradigms for human spaceflight. Um, decision making at different cadences than is currently experienced during space exploration. And using science and discovery as key drivers. So that's one of the main points I want to emphasize is that when we go out into the field, we're always science driven. We always have scientific objectives that need to be addressed and accomplished through these field campaigns. And then on top of that, we overlay the operational components, the technologies, all the other um, exploration components that we're assessing. So looking at CONOPS, what EVA types, what support tools um, do we need to be able to enable this surface science? Um, so for, we had a discussion today in the analogs uh, focus group, and it came up, what actually, what is an analog? Um, so for those that don't work in this uh, realm all the time, these are places on Earth that allow us to approximate operational or, and or physical conditions um, on the Earth that are consistent with other planetary bodies in deep space. Now, of course, we're working on Earth because this is a low-cost, low-risk environment where we can test out these different things. Um, so no analog on Earth is exactly perfect and exactly mimics you know, the site that you're trying to study, say, on the moon or on Mars. So you always be aware of the questions that you're trying to address, and you specifically choose your field sites to address those specific questions and understand the limitations of doing analog-type research. So through the Finesse Project, as I mentioned, um, 
One of the sites that um, the team has gone to is the West Clearwater Impact Structure, which is up in northern Canada. Um, this, is, this work is being led by Gordon Nazinski up in Canada at Western University. Kip Hodges is lead, leading the geochronology work, um, age dating these two impact structures. Um, it's one of the best preservations of some of these impact melts and breaches that we have on the planet, period. Um, having organized a trip there, I know why it is so um, not well studied because it's really hard to get there. Um, Rick Elphick is nodding his head because he went on this trip. It's not trivial, but it's fascinating. We got a lot of great science that came out. And just to uh, em emphasize the point that all these deployments are science driven, you have to have the science publications that come out as a result. So here are some of the examples just of, of the papers. These are all archived um, online. This talk will be archived with the slides if you want to go look these up looking at the geochemical and petrographic studies of the melt veins that um, occurred at West Clearwater. The diocrinate, uh, this is really interesting because we thought when we wrote this proposal that these two impacts, oh, they're right next to each other. There's probably a double impact to happen at the same time. To make a very long story short, doing the geochronology, they're actually different ages and they were different impacts that hit this very unlucky spot um, up in northern Canada. So that's been really interesting and in also developing um, more precise age dating techniques. Um, complex crater formation, so how do you actually form these and what is the shock pressure that's, that's happening in the subsurface to create the features that we see uh, today. Um, and then as I mentioned, there's also an exploration component which we're focused on. And so Barbara Cohen, who just spoke, uh, wrote this paper looking at pre-mission input requirements for successful sample collection by remote teams. It's basically what training do you need to have a priori for those astronauts that are going into the field to make sure that they collect the proper, the correct rocks, the optimal rocks for doing, in this case, age dating and looking at the, at the uh, impact structures. Okay, so that's great. Another site that we go to is in Idaho. It's Crater, uh, Craters of the Moon National Monument and Preserve. Um, this is a really great location. Um, some of our science leads are here. Scott Hughes, I think, is in the back um, from Idaho State University. Shannon Cobes from Idaho State and Brent Gary from NASA Goddard are our science leads there. And we go to Craters of the Moon. We've gone for several years now because of the wide variety of volcanic structures that are similar to structures on the moon. And so you get a great diversity of features that you can look at, which is why we continue to go back there and look at these different, uh, different areas. As I mentioned, we also partner with the Basalt Project that Darlene Lim is leading. Um, and so this has taken the team out to Hawaii. Um, this is the Kilauea, Kilauea volcano. And we were just discussing yesterday how some of the field sites no longer exist uh, because of the recent activity that's in Hawaii. So it's really, really interesting uh, scientifically that uh, this team is one of the last teams that went there and actually collected data from these terrains um, that are no longer there. Um, and we recently, uh, just last month or so, went to Iceland doing comparative studies between some of the features that we see in Idaho as analogs for the moon and then looking at these features in Iceland as well to further the scientific study and remember that it's always science driven and then we lay on top of that the technology so in this case we've got um, our, fo our colleagues from the NASA Kennedy Space Center um, flying UAVs out in Iceland for us as they've done in Idaho and, and many other locations. So we go to these places and we do science there. Um, and this is the first box. As I mentioned, we're focusing on volcanics at these places and also the impacts at West Clearwater. But then we layer on these other components. And what the other parts that we layer on are science operations and technologies. So for science operations, conduct the science within simulated exploration conditions, right? So you act how you would act if you were conducting this mission on the moon. That means you have a couple people on an EVA, you've got an uh, intra-IVA uh, team, you've got an IV hab station, you've got a science backroom that's back on the Earth. Identify which human robotic concepts of operations and supporting capabilities enable the scientific return and discovery. So we're really trying to get at what is it that you need to be able to do the science and optimize that science. And then coupled with that are the technologies. So incorporate and evaluate technologies that are relevant for conducting the science. So as examples, just some of the things that um, are used, mobile science platforms, um, EVA informatics, display technologies, different communications, navigation packages, remote sensing, um, science mission planning tools, timelining tools, um, and scientifically relevant instrument packages. So there are a whole lot of different science um, science technology questions that can be addressed through this work. Um, talking about the operational concepts, so here's the structure of how these things are put together. Um, EVA, of course, is when you've got your potentially two, as Jack recommended, exploration and sampling people that are out 
um, doing their EVAs. You've got the IVA, which is directly supporting those folks that are out on EVA and can have a link to Earth. And then you've got your mission support team back on Earth. Um, so this is a slide that Darlene put together. This is um, from the Hawaii basalt deployment. Um, and so you can see you've got the science backroom team out here. If I can use this pointer to be really tricky, I'm told I can start videos with it. Or maybe the magic in the back room can do it for me. There we go. I'm getting good. They need to, I would say they need to increase this, better this interface for clicking. Okay. So you can see you've got a science back room. You've got your mission support center that's happening up there that's seeing the data come back in real time. So we've got the entire comms infrastructure set up so you can see the information that's being collected on EVA in real time. Uh, we've done multiple deployments with this. Um, I have to thank our Kennedy uh, friends who make this look easy, so I take it for granted. Of course you can get real time data feeds. Um, the IV workstation where you've got folks that would be like in the hab that, that are on site that are monitoring all that, they're extremely busy. There's a lot of information coming back. Um, and then you've got the crew that's out on EVA that's out there, in this case, walking across um, the lava flows. And so there, it's a very complex operation where you're looking at not only the data that's coming back, the communications that are back and forth, the, the discussions that happen, um, the science feed that's coming back, the delegations of authority, time delays, all of these things that get layered in. And so I think that analogs are a good place to test this because you can repeat, you can, uh, as Dan Britt was explaining before, you know, you design it, you build it, you test it, you see what works, you retest it, and you can do that here um, before making the large investments um, for the mission applications. Okay. Um, incorporating new technologies. I'm not going to talk too much about this. I wanted to put this in because um, Alex Selke has a talk. It was at 4 o'clock, so I guess it's at 4.30 now, in the other room, um, where he's really focusing on the incorporation of handheld field instruments. Because this is really turning out to be an incredibly important part of the field work, where you can get real-time data, not only for the science that we're doing, but also for high-grading samples, deciding what samples you want to bring back. So as you can see, you've got the handheld portable instruments. We can also take the, it's like taking our laboratory out into the field so we can get that real-time data, collect the data as we go, and then there are multiple, multiple benefits for having that ability to, to make these collections in the field. So we've got, I think I have in here what we have. We have a few uh, different instruments that seem to be uh, sort of the workhorses that are working out that way. Um, the visible near-infrared spectrometer. Um, this is a slide of Alex's where he's showing the different uh, spectra that you get back. So you really can get real-time mineralogy. It's got its own built-in spectral library, so that's incredibly helpful because you can automatically uh, get a first order, at least a first order assessment of, of what it is that you're looking at. Um, we also have a, a XRF, portable XRF, which again is incredibly useful. You take it out, you see it. So we're using this in the context of science and identifying which of these instruments are most useful for doing our scientific investigations and then feeding that into the uh, operations. Uh, this is um, from Tony Colapreet. He'll be talking next, I think. Um, this is Infield. So this is an instrument that Tony's been working on and his team, a field portable version of the resource prospector nervous instrument. So uh, near infrared, okay, uh, visible spectrometer. So they ruggedized it so that you can take it out into the field. So this is this decisional data um, in support of all this field work that we do. This is getting back to getting that real-time data when you've got boots on the ground, deciding what you want to do, whether it's you're going to sample here, you're going to not sample here, do you go to your next spot, where do you spend your precious EVA time, do you move on to your next station, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this, I'm just going to refer you back because Pascal's telling me to hurry up. Um, Field portable instrument testing and evaluations. I'll refer you to Alex's talk later today. He's also got a paper um, that's in review right now. But road tests these instrument capabilities that can enable and enhance scientific return during human exploration. So he's getting into the nitty gritty details of comparing the lab versus the field results. Looking at the ergonomics and the instrument use considerations, how do you actually use these in the field? Can you get into the crevices? Like, what are the capabilities that that instrument needs to have? Uh, can you actually access the rocks or the outcrops that you need to access? The utility of the instrument data in science decision-making pathways. Um, as I said before, one example is sample high grading. Um, and then out of this, identifying capability, capability requirements for future instrument development. 
um, and leading into hardware development. So as we were talking about earlier today, you know, there's that valley of death in the TRL levels. So you better be sure that the instruments that you want to advance to high to up to TRL 6 that can fly are the ones that you actually really want. These are the ones that you actually need. And so that's where the value, I think, of analog field testing comes in because we can demonstrate the use of these particular instruments. Because some of them net out, like, yeah, this is good. The ASD, like the Visnier spectrometer, that's good. There's been a few we've tested, like, eh, the science return, not so great. So you can start to prioritize where you want to put those precious technology investments. I'm going to skip this because that's, Alex will talk about this later today. Um, one thing I want to talk about in the very last minute is uh, I mentioned that I think it's really important we make a conscious uh, effort to do education and public outreach. And so doing analog field campaigns is a great way to do this because we can bring people into the field and embed them with us in these analog missions. And so we've been running a program called Space We're Bound for uh, many, many years now where we bring students and teachers into the field with us to conduct science and exploration alongside the NASA teams. And so this has worked out really well. We've partnered with uh, multiple space grants um, to do this, to bring the teachers in. They love it because their teachers get hands-on experience. And then the teachers bring this information back to their classrooms, back to their local communities. You know, they give talks. Um, this is one, Tiffany wrote an article um, in one of the prime education magazines that goes out nationwide, et cetera. And so we follow them. Um, actually, all of them usually want to come back, so that's a good sign. They want to come back and deploy with us again. And we follow them post-deployment to see what impact are they having within their schools, with their students in the communities, um, based on their space bound experience. And so we try and tailor this to be optimized for them. So we do pre-deployment training for them. We bring them in, we embed them, and then we follow up with them afterwards. And it actually is turning out to be really great for us, too, because I think it helps remind us why we do this and that it's really cool stuff that we're doing. The work that we're doing is exciting, thinking about going back to the moon. Um, so that's been good. And then one other educational uh, program I wanted to mention was uh, this team called Tater Tots. You can read the acronym um, from Idaho. They're funded, uh, they wrote a grant as undergraduates um, to NASA. There's an undergraduate student instrument project program. So we worked with them through the finesse team to help them craft their proposal. They wrote this proposal and they got funded. So this team of undergraduate students um, built payloads. They built some instruments and spectrometers. Um, People on the finesse team, especially Tony, were very instrumental in helping them identify the science questions and then what instruments could help address those science questions um, in a Idaho at Craters of the Moon. They flew a high altitude balloon. They collected data. It was a great experience for them. And so it was great for us, too, to be able to partner and help enable um, them to do that. So there are many, many other examples I could show you of outreach activities um, that are probably good to do. And so with that, I'm going to stop talking. Thank you. We have time maybe for one question. Okay. Did, did you have uh, TV monitoring the activities of the TV monitoring the activities of the uh, astronauts or your fuel team? Yes, there were UAVs that were flying at the same time. And uh, yep. how were they being directed? Uh, by uh, Mike Downs from KSC on the ground. He could act, he he flies them as they're there. So he's in the field, he's flying the UAVs, seeing what's going over flight. And then we also had separate UAV flights where we said, these are our science targets, can you just fly over these, you know, even without the EVA people. One on the of the things I've realized in going through the uh, Apollo 17 uh, transcripts recently uh, is that we never integrated the TV operators with the field training. And as a result, okay. the TV operator often was off looking at things that interested that operator uh -huh. rather than following right. the activities that were on the surface. So it's just something to keep in your mind. Yeah, that's that that's, they need to be integrated yes. in the planning and in the and, and in the actual operations. Yes, and there's also an EVA suit cam that's been integrated um, that's being fed back to the back room, so you can see. You know, as that astronaut is picking up a rock, you know, what angle are they picking up the rock from? Because you care about that if you're doing astrobiology, for example. So that's starting, but that's a good point. I'll relay that back to the team. Okay. Uh, moving right along. Uh, oh, and a reminder for questions. To, yeah, please wait for the microphones to the folks who are following along. 